Coming up, the Guinness Book of Records celebrates 100 million copies. This is one of the entrants. Thailand's Festival of Loi Kratong, where people release banana leaf baskets to float their bad luck away. Radio station broadcasts tango and performs it live before a studio audience. And an eight-year-old Balinese mask maker keeps the tradition alive. That and more coming right up. In the obscure world of Guinness record setting, few attempts can be as strange or dangerous as the one attempted by Viktor Ravioff, a black belt karate expert who beat the existing attempt by lying on a bed of 20 centimeter steel nails and being nearly crushed by some 326 kilos of concrete that his assistants had piled on him. If that wasn't enough to spice up his weekend, Raviov had an assistant shatter the blocks with the blow of a sledgehammer, which further increased the pressure. Raviov was clearly overjoyed at having punctured the previous record set by a man in Thailand who could only support 235 kilos and had to be hospitalized after the attempt. The feat was supervised by a lawyer to make sure it conformed to the Guinness rules for record breaking. He subsequently shattered another record, that of having 17 concrete blocks weighing 6.5 kilos smashed with a 7 kilo hammer. Raviov, whose hobbies include using a sabre to slice potatoes placed on the heads of nervous assistants, has but one piece of advice. Don't do this at home. OK, Victor, we promise. And this is never going to replace the potato peeler either. And whilst we're on the subject of Guinness World Records, a burp from the loudest belcher in the world echoed round Britain's Tate Modern Gallery as the Guinness World Records book celebrated the release of its 100 millionth copy. The book, which lists world records from the smallest dog to the highest paid TV guest star, has its own entry in the latest edition as the best-selling copyright book of all time. So there they all were, those who'd done it longer, farther, higher, deeper, wider and better than anybody else, all gathered to celebrate this unique publication. The original book was present also. The longest tongue record now belongs officially to British chauffeur Stephen Taylor and measuring a whopping 9.4 centimetres from lip to tip. He was discovered on a chat show. However, Stephen's tongue didn't garner the attention that Elaine Davidson's did. She satiated her desire to be entered into the book as a record holder who has had 1,903 piercings, studs and rings over her tattooed body. The Brazilian living in Edinburgh says she does all the work herself and had once pierced herself 85 times around her waistline in just two hours. 
Britain's tallest man was another eye-catching record holder. At 2.32 metres, 59-year-old Charles Greener was listed in the Guinness Book in 1969, but is still 19 centimetres shorter than the world's tallest woman. Paul Hun, 34, excuse me, produced the loudest burp in the world and is keen on retaining his record. He started burping in the schoolyard and continued in the pub. He said it seemed a natural progression. All record holders present signed the 100 millionth copy of the Guinness Book. Guinness World Records Limited is based in London, England. A number of high-profile records are broken on a regular basis. For example, the Radio DJ Marathon that stood at 37 hours in 1999 is now well over 60 hours, with more attempts being made every month. Another record that's broken regularly is the oldest living person in the world, where details of the holder's birth have been officially corroborated. The individual who holds the most Guinness World Records is Mr. Ashrita Furman. He holds the records for, among others... Backward cycling, long-distance pogo stick jumping, most glasses balanced on the chin, most hopscotch games in 24 hours, fastest time to pogo stick up the CN Tower, and most skips over a skipping rope in 24 hours. If you wish to try something that hasn't been done before or have already attempted a potential record, then your suggestion is passed on to their research department. Thousands of Germans dressed in colourful costumes have celebrated the start of the carnival season in the stronghold of Cologne. The four-month carnival season, commonly known as the fifth season of the year, traditionally kicks off at 11.11am on the 11th day of the 11th month with three chants of a laugh, a laugh, a laugh. I like a laugh. It's believed the expression originates from Kerlin al-Af, meaning Cologne rules. People who've never before met link arms and sway from side to side, a dance known as Schunken. Despite the often freezing temperatures, large amounts of traditional Cologne beer called Kulsch are consumed and add to the festive mood. Looking at these people, I think that the festive mood relies very strongly on Kulsch. Carnival means everything to a lot of people, to be able to get out and party, to be happy and forget all the stress. Oh, stop it, I feel seasick. Thank you. They've all been to the same hairdresser, obviously. Carnival is celebrated in Germany's predominantly Catholic West and South, with much swaying to traditional ballads and brass bands. Carnival culminates in February, with processions on Rose Monday and Shrove Tuesday, the last day before Lent, the fasting period which precedes Easter. There are approximately 160 Carnival societies, local history societies and district groups in Cologne, which celebrate their hometown festival in about 500 sessions, balls and parades. The highlight is always the Rose Monday Parade. I think our cameraman just got lucky. These happy people are standing in Cologne's Altermarkt Square, the epicentre of the Carnival stronghold. From Germany to Thailand and another festival, this is a fishing village and it's one of many around the area of Yao, which is the largest lake in northern Thailand.
Famous for being a prime fish breeding ground, it supports the dozens of fishing villages and towns that line its shores and draws vital tourists to the area. Every year as the sun starts to set on the full moon night of the 12th lunar month, hundreds of fishermen congregate in the centre of the lake to perform one of Thailand's most beautiful and well-loved traditions. Their crude wooden canoes loaded with rice, whiskey, food and extended family members wait for darkness and the start of Yi Peng, a tradition in which they rid themselves of a year's worth of sins and worries by releasing hundreds of paper lanterns into the night sky. The fishermen of Pai Yao choose to perform Yi Peng from the centre of the lake they fish each day, as locals gather in Pai Yao town to dance, celebrate and watch the fiery lanterns fly from the small boats rafted together in the centre of the lake. This is North Thailand's unique addition to the festival of Loi Kratong, where people release kratong or banana leaf baskets into rivers and lakes in the belief that their troubles and bad luck will float away with them. The paper lanterns or kom loi are flimsy constructions of mulberry paper and bamboo with burners underneath made of rolls of toilet paper soaked in wax or paraffin. As the first lantern is launched, the men sing songs comparing the lake to a beautiful and fertile woman, thanking the water gods for their livelihood. It's also the chance to repent of sins and appease the water gods, particularly important for a community which lives off the water and its produce. Welcome to the 57th Mr. Universe at a glittering ceremony held in Bombay, India. Judging was a difficult task as the competition to show off was fierce. This is the six-time winner, Al Shahai Mabruk. A movie icon in Egypt, Mabruk, sporting a blonde crew cut, failed to woo the judges. But the man on the left, Rene Zimmerman from Switzerland, beat the Egyptian favourites to become Mr. Universe. The stadium was packed to capacity as hundreds turned up to watch the event. Zimmerman beat 190 bodybuilders from 54 countries to lift the coveted title. Though this is the first time India has hosted the competition, it's no stranger to the title, having produced three Mr. Universe winners in the past. That reminds me, I must ring my mother-in-law. And at the other end of the spectrum, 26-year-old Vida Samadzai is the first Afghan to compete in a beauty pageant in 31 years. Vida has made headlines for parading in the competition in a bikini, representing a conservative Muslim country where most women wear head-to-toe burqas. However, the media coverage didn't help her get the title of Miss Earth, which went to Miss Honduras, Dania Prince. The first runner-up was Miss Brazil, Priscilla Zandona. Organisers of the Miss Earth beauty pageant didn't let Vida go home without a prize. They gave her a special award called Beauty for a Cause. In her homeland, few would know what the title means, but Miss Earth organiser Ramon Monzon said the Afghan should praise Vida instead of condemning her for joining the contest.
Samadzai, a dark-eyed girl from a Pakhtun tribe who fled Afghanistan with her family in 1996, stepped out in a red bikini at the international beauty pageant in the Philippines, professing to make the world aware of the Afghan woman's talent, intelligence and beauty. She's the first Afghan woman in over 30 years to participate in a beauty contest, but she has incurred the wrath of the few Afghans who've seen her photographs or have read the international news stories. Under Afghan culture, women should not demonstrate their worth through their beauty or bodies, but by their skills and knowledge. The extremist Taliban, whose rule Samadzai escaped in 1996, forced women to cover themselves from head to toe and prohibited them from attending schools, working outside their homes or stepping out without a close relative. Several years after their regime was toppled, competing in a bikini in a beauty contest remains taboo. While Samadzai competes with beauty queens from around the world, thousands of Afghan women still watch the world through the narrow holes of their burqas. Vida plans to return to Afghanistan later this month to join her fellow activists to work for the recognition of women's rights in her country. And now we travel across the water to Argentina. Large photos of tango greats Carlos Gardel and Tita Morello grace the walls of a local Buenos Aires radio station while their music fills the station's studio during one of its new and popular broadcasts of a live tango performance. The live performance is a tradition that harkens back to the 1940s, a time seen by many as the golden age of radio and of tango. The station's artistic director, Jorge Weisbord, said that although he didn't initially set out to revive the golden era of tango, much of the magic seems to have returned. He considers tango will transcend the generations as long as there are new musicians and new audiences. This was very difficult to sustain a few years ago when young people didn't look to tango and the older people were dying, he explained. But tango has lost some of its popularity in ensuing decades and the live broadcast stopped. Today, however, tango is undergoing a renaissance in Argentina and the weekly live radio performances have returned. New venues for tango in Argentina also include a new television station, 50 radio stations, dozens of magazines and hundreds of new internet sites. If Japan's mobile phone giant NTT Docomo has its way, handsets will be the thing of the past. Welcome instead, the finger set. Calling home may soon be just a click of the fingers away. Multimedia Laboratories, the research centre for NTT Docomo, has come up with a way of transmitting sound from phones, in this case miniaturised to watch size, into the human bones via tiny vibrations from a device on the back of a wristband. It uses the biological phenomenon called bone conduction, the reason why people can still hear their own voice clearly, even with their ears plugged. The receiving voice is converted into vibration and reaches the fingertip via bone conduction. The prototype phone, called at this stage finger whisper, also uses this phenomenon to transfer sound from the fingertip to the ear bone structure meaning the conversation is so quiet to all except the receiver that no one else can eavesdrop on the conversation. Mime's speech recognition, 
which detects muscle signals and recognises in movement of the mouth different words, may help not only mute people speak, but also make speech in a noisy environment easier to hear. But to me, it just looks like it's becoming too complicated. To Indonesia now, and as a moonlit night falls on Bali, local people come together to perform a variety of rituals and ceremonies as offerings to their deities. One of the most famous ceremonies in Bali is the traditional mask or topeng dance drama, which takes place at least once a month during a full moon. These magical, totemic masks have come to represent Bali to many visitors, who are spellbound by their exotic, gargoyle-like demeanour and their entertaining presence in evening dance spectacles and in almost every art shop window all around the island. The Balinese are famous for carving elaborately detailed wooden masks in a wide variety of forms, reflecting the Hindu belief that everything has an active spirit. A mask communicates some of the life of the ceremonial world that it represents. Although their features are fixed, the masks come to life during a performance as they become as animated as the faces of human actors. However, these days there are only a handful of carvers left making the traditional Balinese topeng and struggling to keep the art alive. Eight-year-old Wayang Tangu operates from his workshop in a traditional 200-year-old Balinese home surrounded by masks in various stages of completion. Wyan's masks are based mostly on characteristics derived from human nature and the different phases of life people go through. Tangu doesn't refer to any pictures or sketches when carving his masks. The mask is treated like a holy, powerful object and they believe it has the power to heal and teach when used in dance performances. The masks are painted in an array of local natural colours to highlight their features. The white paint powder is made of mashed pig bones and from other natural dyes. After the sanding and carving is finished, an undercoat of white gesso is applied, followed by the colourful paints applied on top. Wyan claims it's essential to use natural dyes, especially on the eyes and the teeth, to give the mask a realistic look. They're finely buttered with a coat of lacquer to give them the final dazzle. Horsehair is sometimes added as moustaches and beards to add character to the mask. Legend has it that the more natural all the elements on the mask are, the easier it is for the spirit to enter. The Gianya area in Bali is well known for mask makers, but it's a dying trade as there are only a handful of master carvers such as Wayan Tangu left. Wayan has been teaching the craft for over 50 years when he started in the 1950s. Unfortunately, to date, only 50 students have graduated under his guidance. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll go and call my mother-in-law. I know, it's strange, but true. I'm tired of the